This is MJ. I'm an author, I'm an artist, I'm an analyzer. Find all my work at mjmunios.com. Henshin Inspection presents Super Sentai Sanctuary. I will be discussing the art of breaking and bending rules. This is Super Sentai Sanctuary episode 23, More Than Enough. Avatar Sentai Down Brothers episode 23, Inu Goes to the Dogs. Originally aired August 7, 2022. The writer is Toshiki Inoue. The director is Katsuya Watanabe. First off, negative thing. I need more bestial action. What is the point of having them arrive so early in the story when they have done so little at this point? I think the bestials have been around for since episode 16, which would be like six or seven weeks ago, which is a long time. That's almost two months that we've known of bestials, but we haven't really gotten many developments from them. There's just been little tidbits and that's it. And it's kind of driving me crazy. On a positive note, Tsubasa instantly thinking of Tsuyoshi when he was in trouble is really cool. It's very sweet that he's thinking, oh, I know. When I'm in trouble, who's the person I can always rely on? And it was you, Peter. It was always been you. No, uh, it was Tsuyoshi. And then, uh, when Tsuyoshi isn't available, he begrudgingly goes and asks help from Taro. And I thought that was a really nice touch because it speaks to the fact that Taro is a little irritating. He's a frustrating person to be around or to work with. And I like that that is actually reflected in the narrative. And I believe that the translation that I read actually has uh, to, um, Tsubasa saying something along the lines of, like, oh, I can't believe I have to go to him. Or I guess I'll have, I have no choice but to go to him. And it's said with such dread. And uh, I, I think that came through in the, ap- in the actor's you know, performance vocally. I could hear him saying, you know, stressing the words that way. Um, so that was pretty cool. Pretty, pretty cool. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and go into... Uh, my score for the episode, and I'll just let you know, I gave it a 9 out of 10, and I want to rank this lower, but I was so enamored by the visuals that I'm giving it a pass. Uh, I'm going to ask you to stick around for my best in Don Bros segment to hear tell of how how the visuals really blew me away, and what is that best in Don Bros section? Well, uh, I've been doing something on TikTok, and I've been putting it up on YouTube and Odyssey as well, where it's a short segment, uh, three minutes or less, basically, talking about what's the worst thing, the best thing, and the most interesting thing in. I've been doing that for Don Brothers, and uh, as well as Futo PI, and I've decided to incorporate that into the actual episode, so after I give you my reflection and talk about a couple more things, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just lead into that segment. Uh, I've trimmed it down so there's not all this back and forth, it's just the, you know, the segments, it's the the worst, best, and most interesting thing, and then it'll go into the outro, uh, because because uh, I think it's good enough. I think it's good enough. Uh, sometimes there's not much to say, and I don't want to force myself to say, but I do like doing that worst, best, and most interesting thing. Uh, but then I kind of realized I, it was becoming a little redundant, so I don't want to be redundant and bore anybody. So here we go. Uh, here's my reflection. I'm going to talk for, I don't know, five or so minutes about this this idea. What is the art of breaking and bending rules, and how do you know that it'll work? And uh, well, I'll just get right into it. And, and this is because I'm interested in, in writing, right? It, writing is something that fascinates me. I, I want to pursue it as a, a profession. And um, the reason I'm asking this question is because we are basically seeing uh, rules get broken sort of in, in this episode. Because uh, while the narrative structure would dictate, and if you've been watching Super Sentai or, or Power Rangers for any time, um, the rules would dictate. And by the way, I invite you to go ahead and leave now. If you want to skip ahead to where I start talking about the uh, the worst, best, and uh, most interesting thing, do that, or you can go look on TikTok, or um, it's MJ Munoz AAA, or AAA, uh, that's the only thing I could get, I couldn't get author or anything, and I thought artist, author, artist, analyzer, A is kind of, you know, part of my branding, so I guess I'll do that, but it's it's dumb, maybe I should change it to A3 or something like that, it could be cooler, anyway, uh, but if you don't want to hear my reflection of me talking like about, you know, writing and the craft of it and whatever, in the context of the show, then go ahead and leave now, um, or you, like I said, you can uh, skip ahead, or you can go check out those other places where places where I post and uh, yeah yeah I'll give you a couple seconds to leave so anyway here we go uh, really get into it so there's a couple things that were breaking the rules and actually I'm honestly having a little bit of a hard time remembering so I'm actually gonna scroll through my images for the episode so we had <laughs> this is ostensibly a focus episode for uh, for Subasa right but it sort of isn't uh, we get to see Subasa cursed because a dog dies, it gets hit by a car, I think, someone's puppy, this kid's puppy, and then he sets up a shrine for it with a leash and water bottle and, uh, like, a soccer ball that he puts on top of the leash, you know, because it contains it, keeps it from rolling away, it, like, it mounts it there, basically. Um, and uh, Subasa, I believe, 
sees this, or maybe I think it's actually Hiromi. Is that his right? Miho. It's Miho and uh, Tsuyoshi who see the kid and they, you know, kind of help him with it or whatever. And then I think something happens with Tsubasa and he accidentally breaks it or knocks it over. I think he's the one who breaks it. Maybe he's not. But regardless, he becomes cursed by the spirit of this dog. And, you know, the dog is dead. I don't know if it died on the spot when it got hit by the car there and that's why the kid has the shrine there. I mean, this is uh, hopefully not, you know, a tasteless analysis or... Um, analog but where i live every now and then i'll see like on the roadside uh, even like by a you know over bridge of a like by a you know gas station there's a gas station there's a bridge over a freeway and there's like on the freeway on the side of the freeway there's this one place in particular where i've seen like a shrine set up or or, or uh, something in memoriam of a person who died and i don't know did that person die on the street right there on the bridge that's crossing over or did they die on the freeway underneath which is more likely because it's a very busy freeway and I could see accidents happening there especially because it's like on ramp off ramp territory and that's kind of to me that's like the most dangerous part of when you're driving on the freeway anyway I don't know like how close is the the memoriam site to the site of the death of the the grieved person uh or the person you know for whom people are grieving uh and in the case of this kid with the dog did his dog die right there on the street and then like is the soul of the dog if dogs do in fact have a soul which I believe in Japanese <laughs> understanding of things they would but i don't know about my how i think about that but regardless is the soul of the the dead animal does it stay there at the at the site of their death and i'm talking about the show specifically now because if it does i could sort of see it making sense you know like water is offered to the dog i don't know if there was food or not but there were flowers there for sure and it very much looks like a situation of, again, that I've only ever seen in anime or manga or tokusatsu, where someone's at the grave site, visiting the gravestone of their um, of their departed uh, loved one, and they're you know smoking incense there at the at the big gravestone, and they typically bring flowers. And I don't know about food or anything like that, but I I do uh, have a little bit of a tiny taste of a background uh, into like Shintoism, which I believe would be the predominant. Uh, source of these rituals in Japanese culture and society. Um, and it has to do with ancestor worship. I don't know if food is actually brought to the, to the departed or not. Um, but there's at least the offering of the water and maybe that's because dogs drink water and it'd be difficult to have, you know, dog food wherever you go, but you can always fill a cup with water and then put it there for the dog, you know, for the shrine. Um, yeah. Anyway, so like in a world, <laughs> Uh, you know, why am I going off about this? Because I find it really interesting. In a world where you have the Dawn Brothers, they're doing these avatar changes, there's other Super Sentai somehow that exist as well. Um, I don't know of a Super Sentai that specifically... Ha well, I guess like Zhu Ranger, I've heard that like their Megazord is God. Or it's like it's die something and it's supposed to basically be God uh, in like a Megazord form or something crazy like that. Um, so there's a lot of playing fast and loose and I'm not trying to say that uh, Dawn Brothers has to be consistent with the rest of Super Sentai history and uh, canon if they're even really... I think there's like crossover canon and then there's each individual show has its own canon uh, and that's how they can play fast and loose with it and, and have things set up in, in interesting ways throughout the different Super Sentai series. But, I mean, there's another world of Cerebrans, there's a world of Bestials, I guess there's another world where some creator exists who created the whole universe and by the rules that they set... Uh, it's okay for them to, like, they set it up so that a dog can haunt a gravesite, and if you mess with the gravesite, uh, karma can be inflicted upon you, and you could be cursed to turn into a dog, because, you know, throughout the course of this episode, Tsubasa turns into a dog, he gets stuck in his Inu brother form, he's a little tiny puppet carting around, and then eventually, like, we're seeing the puppet as the audience, the, yeah, the Inu brother, Inui brother puppet, but in actuality or in the world of the show, people are seeing an actual dog, and as he's trying to speak, there's it's overdubbed. Like You can still hear his voice, but there's dubbed over him barking noises. So, like, he's turned into a dog, and then eventually he turns into an actual physical dog, some black... I don't know what it is, but it's this really cute all-black dog. Um, reminds me of a Weimaraner, but I don't think it is one. I don't know dogs that well, but it does remind me of that. Uh, I don't think it's a black lab, but it could be. Whatever. doesn't matter. And a little girl takes the dog in and adopts him, and she's feeding her dog... Uh, at home when the curse is lifted because uh, the rest of the cast solves the problem and like releases the the fury of the ghost or whatever and like oh no 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 it's uh I guess is it after Tsuyoshi and Miho fix the shrine is that when the curse is lifted that might be the case and then he's transformed from being 
a literal dog back into being a person, but he's still on the leash and he keeps eating the food that the little girl set there for him, the dog food. And she's like, continues to pet him in this really awkward, weird way. And then the episode, I, I think the episode closes on that. And I just, I don't understand what anyway is doing, why he's writing that. Uh, like, I don't understand what the point is. Um, but I do think well, and then, uh, you know, going back, touching back on the bestials, I don't understand why the bestials were introduced so long ago, and yet we've done nothing with them. And to an extent, like, I get that the Don brothers, or at least, you know, Momotaro, you know, Taro, or Taro, Momoi, he's supposed to be, like, protecting the world or whatever, but, like, who's he supposed to be protecting the world from? Because when it started out, it looked like he was supposed to be protecting the world from the Cerebrans, the Hitsutsuki specifically, but possibly the Cerebrans, and it was confusing because the... He's, the Cerebrans can also turn people into monsters, but those monsters are distinct from Hitsotsuki, I believe. So, like, n not a lot of it makes sense. Like, I'm very much enjoying Don Brothers still. I really like it. This episode, like I said, it the visuals and the directing alone made me give this episode a 9 out of 10. Had the other stuff not been, like, had it been a more conventional episode and been more normal and more interesting, I might have given it a 10. And the weird stuff just kind of maybe distracted me from it. I mean, it was entertaining in the moment, but also it made me think, like, what's going on? And I was able to enjoy the episode immensely in spite of that, and specifically because of the amazing visuals and amazing fight choreography uh, with, um, with your boy uh, Jiro getting his power up and... Well, I guess your boys, Jiro's, getting their power up or whatever. Um, but, like, like, I don't even know what the rules are for this world and for this universe. And I'm sure Inoue does know what the rules are for his universe that he set up with Dawn Brothers. But, like... <sighs> It must just be because he's been writing Super Sentai and Kamen Rider and who knows what else for so long that he knows when it's okay to just throw things to the side in order to do what you want with the story because like I'm sitting here and I should be super critical about how this stuff didn't make sense but I'm not and I don't care and Inoue didn't write the the fight necessarily I'm sure he wrote the stuff about uh like the conflict and there being the two Jiros and whatever and um maybe he had the idea about there being conflict between like the dragon and the tiger and that kind of stuff but like the actual fight choreography unless he was like make this fight amazing guys like is that his note in the script? I don't know. Um, so, and it's obvious to me that, like, yeah, Inoue's the writer, but and as far as, like, do they break story together? Is there a writing team who helps him? He, like, architects the thing and then, like, subs it out to people? I don't know. But there have to be, there has to be some collaboration with uh, the directors and, and, you know, other people, that, you know, Bandai for selling the toys and whatnot. So, like, I wonder how exactly that influence works. But regardless, this guy, Inoue, he's, I, I, I think he, you know, the buck stop. Uh, stops with him and he gets the blame or the the praise because his name is on it right but like how did he know it was okay to do this crazy thing where uh one of our heroes gets turned into a dog like a literal dog because of a curse related to i guess like shintoism and you know things from japanese culture that are easy to recognize in a world where he also has it set up where there are different worlds so does the existence of these various worlds negate the uh, like, you know, Shinto creation myth? I have no idea. I don't even know if Inoue thinks about that or cares about that. Or, like, is the idea that he's so skilled and so knowledgeable uh, or has so much experience in writing that he can feel like, you know what, I uh, I can go ahead and mess with these rules right now that are established for the universe and it'll be okay because people will just roll with it. It'll be fine. Or is it the case, and I've noticed this, and I've been noticing it uh, a lot recently, but it's been uh, becoming more uh, pronounced to me recently, especially after watching this episode, that we don't really know what the rules are for the universe or the world of Don Brothers or whatever. We're like, we go into the show and we kind of project our worldview, or at least I do, onto it and just presume certain things will happen and certain things won't happen. The Don Brothers are always going to win. Uh... People, civilians, really aren't going to get killed. And when they do get killed, um, it's shocking. And then we turn out, oh, no, uh, you know, Tsuyoshi didn't actually kill that guy. He just sent him to the uh, the Phantom Zone. And it's okay because you can pull people out of there. So I guess the Cerebrans were evil at first, but maybe now they're not. So there's a, a lot of, um, I think this is a, a really powerful tool uh, to use. 
And maybe it, it alters my question fundamentally, which is, you know, not, uh, you know, how do you know when to bend the rules? But maybe as a creative, you should more judiciously spell out what the rules are. So maybe go into stories being vague and letting the reader bring a lot of things, a lot of assumptions to it, and don't overly define the world and just define it by you, the hard and fast actions that you take, the pivots that you take. So uh, apparently uh, some form of, you know, Shintoism is real and it blends in with the fact that there are bestials and cerebrans and all these other things. And I have to be okay with that if I'm going to accept the consistency of the world or universe of Dawn Brothers. But then again, does the world or, uh, of Dawn Brothers not really care about having its own consistency? Maybe it doesn't, and maybe I should be okay with that. And I'm not mad at it, and I'm not saying I shouldn't be okay with that. I'm just saying I hadn't really thought of it that way before, but now actually thinking about it and analyzing it, maybe um, the, the real trick, the real art is to not use any rules to set up the f to set up the fewest amount of rules as possible for your world especially if it's not like a hard science fiction so that you know if it's more this fantasy superhero type of storytelling that way you can do whatever it gives you the maximum freedom to do whatever you want you just have to choose and stick to the consequences of your actions when you introduce new concepts or ideas in the world i i guess that's it so yeah i i, I don't uh, <laughs> i don't know where to go from there i do not know where to go from there um Except to tell you that if you're still here, I appreciate it, and I'd like you to stick around for, again, the worst, the best, and the most interesting thing in Dawn Brothers, and believe it or not, this wasn't the most interesting thing. I'm holding that off till the end. Uh, so, uh, yeah, check those out, and I'll give myself a couple seconds of space to edit this in, and then I'll, uh, I'll hop out for the intro, I guess. The worst thing in Don Brothers 23 is the, uh, <laughs> the Inui, uh, brother puppet, uh, puppeteering, I guess you could say. So, uh, when I say worst thing, sometimes worst means least best or least good thing of all, because in actuality, I liked the puppeteering of this thing. I like the giant head. Uh, I don't know if that's just a, a helmet on a stick or if it's a helmet on the top of a puppet or whatever. We've seen some close shots where he's holding up the gun, maybe right next to his gigantic head, which is way bigger than the hands. And, uh, I don't know exactly what that's coming from. I don't know if that's close-up shots of a guy in a regular suit. I think I've seen maybe like a stage show version of the shoot, of the suit rather, where it's a standard suit. It's, you know, the, the full size, it's black, uh, except it has a gigantic Inui brother head on it. Like, I don't know, like this big, right? Because it's kind of keeping the same, I think it's the same exact head that's used for the little puppet and for the, the full suit for like a, you know, like I said, like a stage show version of it or whatever. The only other way they could do a stage show version of the suit is if they had it puppeteered somehow. I'm thinking about like how they had those puppet or the people puppeteering stuff in Lion King, the, the stage play version of it, the musical, like the Broadway version, I guess is the, the way you say it. Or, um, like a, you know, Kabuki type puppet. That'd be the only way to do it. But Anyway, I like the effect. I thought it was cool how, uh, just, I thought it was cool how they kind of took this weird element and this weird thing that they kind of have to do because of the way they've decided to make the suits and make the characters be so, so different in their size. Um, and they just went with it and they went hard with it. And I really appreciate that. And I mean, the CGI is janky. I would almost, I think I'd rather see in most cases them using some form of puppeteering over the CGI, not because I'm a pure, uh, you know, practical effects guy over a digital effects guy, because I like whatever effect works the best and looks the best for the moment, but something about, to me, Super Sentai uh, and Tokusatsu in general, there's, it's a little more forgiving. You can go a little bit more with something a little more ridiculous like a puppet. Um, or even maybe they could have designed it to be like a, a marionette or something for Inui Brother. I don't know. But uh, I really dug it. Um, the way they composed the shots was different. And um, when it's like the full body where he's maybe three feet tall uh, and like uh, Miho is holding him and stuff that you know that works that works for sure when he's laying on the pile of trash that works and anyway just it's the least good thing of this episode because i think this was a really cool episode there was so much more good about it so many things i like better than this but it was something i really wanted to highlight because i thought it was cool and it turns out it happens to be the the worst thing in an episode full of great stuff so anyway the best thing in Don Brothers episode 23 is the amazing fight choreography and the amazing set design that were going on in the uh ar world when uh I don't even know what the thing is called, but when, uh, for some reason, and I'll touch on this later, uh, Jiro splits into two guys. He's the feral tiger dude, uh, Don Torbolt, I guess, and then he's uh, the more 
refined, more controlled Don Dragoku. Um, anyway, when he gets his, what do they call it? I guess his Robotaro form, basically, or I don't know what it's called, but his Robotaro type form. When he gets that, it's super cool. Uh, the, the, like I said, the, the, it, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm summing over myself because how cool it was. The fight was amazing. The setting was amazing. The directing was top tier. This, we may have seen some of the best, or we may have seen the best directing we've seen in this entire show, in this episode. And honestly, the story was a little lackluster in some ways, and I don't really get the whole Inui Brother thing, everything that was going on with him, but I actually don't care because I thoroughly enjoyed this fight so much, and I really was blown away by the visuals that they were getting here. And there's also a concept kind of, uh, well, I'll touch on that later. <laughs> there's also a concept that has to do with how he gets his robotic, his Don Robo form or whatever. But just, I mean, the fight was amazing. I, I actually, you know, there's the, the Toku gifts or whatever on, on Twitter. I'm, if they don't make a gif out of some of the stuff from this episode, I'm, I have it time stamped and, uh, screen grabbed so I know where to grab and I can load it into my video editing software and, uh, and get some going because it's just, there's some top tier stuff going on in this episode, uh, as far as the, like I said, the art direction for that new AR world place that we went to and then the fight choreography was just amazing. And there were some scenes where I thought, I can't tell if that's a practical suit or a CGI suit based on how good it looks. It, it must be practical, but based on how fluidly it's moving, it must be uh, CGI. But honestly, I don't know. And I was just absolutely blown away by the visuals. So, uh, yeah, typically I'm all about the story and I only really care about, you know, whether people are, you know, being portrayed in realistic ways for them, even though it's a crazy fantasy show. But if they're consistent and if it's compelling... That's what really gets me. But man, these visuals, I, I didn't care what the story was going on around it. It was just super cool. I would love for it to have more meaning by being, uh, you know, I, I would like to be elevated by having a lot of meaning attached to it. But right now it's kind of like it's an opening of a mystery and I'm intrigued by that. And then just, like I said, the visuals just totally knocked me over. So super cool, <laughs> super cool stuff. Anyway, uh, that's all I have to say for now about the best thing in Don Brothers, which was those friggin' fantastic visuals. The most interesting thing, uh, the most perplexing thing, the thing that makes me scratch my head about Don Brothers 23 is this whole Don Torah Bolt or Feral Jiro coming out of Jiro. I don't understand what that's about. I don't know. I mean, I guess technically you could say we had a warning or a hint or would have had some knowledge that something like this was coming because of the fact that he has had this voice inside of him and we've seen him switch into this alternate, you know, more aggressive personality. But at the same time, just because someone's hearing a voice inside of them and has an alternate personality doesn't mean that that personality and that voice will physically become manifest and burst out of them and be an entirely different person. I have no idea where this came from. I don't know what's going on. Uh, something cool about it, though, is when he got his Don Robotaro form or whatever it's called. I Don, whatever. I can't remember. I can't keep track of the names. But the tiger is encased in the dragon and that's super weird like i don't quite understand what's going on i thought this was supposed to be the four guardians you know like biako and well biako's the tiger right um i thought this was like biako and was it Shwish? i don't know whatever you know the dragon the turtle uh the phoenix and the the tiger i thought that's what they were going for with this whole thing but maybe they're not or maybe they are i'm not sure <clears throat> i may just not know enough about it to be able to uh speak authoritatively on it at all which is probably the case so anyway but I just found it really interesting that this dragon is encasing this tiger and like holding it in check and controlling it. And I think he like pats the drag, uh, the tiger like pats the dragon's head at some point or something. And there's basically like these two forces within him that are struggling. Uh, and he's currently struggling or able to, um, you know, win the struggle, Jiro is, to be good and to help the Dawn brothers and not attack them and not hurt them. He's being heroic. He's being a true hero by controlling uh, even his base instincts, you could say. Um, this more feral, more aggressive part of himself that just wants to seize the hero uh and the victory and all these things, the glory, you could say, too, uh, for himself. But he's keeping that stuff in check, and he's uh, he's doing good. He's harnessing that energy and putting it towards a good cause, towards defeating evil and, you know, the bad guys and helping the good guys, right? But it's weird because, like, like I said, this just came out of nowhere. I have no idea why this is happening in the show. And I don't think we had any clues that this was going to happen. And it's just, it's super bizarre. <clears throat> I have no idea where they're going with it. And I'll be interested to see now, like, are they going to flip it around? Is the dragon going to be controlled by the tiger and we'll see an evil form there? Or what exactly is going on 
and why is it going on more importantly? I don't know. It's just very strange. I'm, I'm very flummoxed by this. Uh, and like I said, I don't quite get what's going on. Okay. though. So that's going to do it for now. Uh, I thank you for sticking around and I am curious to hear your feedback on the new ish format, uh, because this really works for me, I think. And if it really works for you, then that's great. Cause then we all win and, uh, that'll be wonderful. So anyway, uh, check out mgmoonews.com for more of my work. I've got analysis of Futo PI going on right now. Um, I'm probably like, I'm 99% sure I'm going to be covering Common Rider Geats as well. And basically I intend to ramp up my production on analyzing stuff while still working on getting books published. Um, it's, uh, July, no, it's August right now. And I plan to very work very hard to get, um, children's books published this year, uh, before the end of 2022. And we'll see, uh, where we go from there. Uh, you know, please God, I'll have, I'll have a lot of success and I'll be even more free to keep doing even more of this analysis stuff. Cause I figure the more, uh, I'm doing the better, the, the more I'm a doing, the better I'm a, I'm a doing. That doesn't work. Never mind. Goodbye. Uh, please ignore my fumbling and my attempts to be silly and humorous. Uh, this is MJ. Uh, take care until next time folks. And I leave you with peace and blessings, but please come back for more, uh, more blazing analysis. This is a part of the Story Over Everything initiative.